Welcome to this eLearn Security video training lesson on Stack Frames. In this video, we will debug the Funk Test application in order to inspect how the stack changes. This will help us to better understand how the stack and the registers work, and also how stack frames are created and destroyed. Although we did not introduce any debugging software yet, we will use Immunity Debugger, one of the most famous debuggers for Windows. The source code of the program that we are going to inspect is the following. As we can see, it is a very simple program. In the main function, we define three local variables named x, z, and y. Then we call the function named functest, and we pass three values. Within the function, we simply define two more local variables, and then the program ends. Although this program does nothing, it will be very useful to understand how stack frames are created. In order to start debugging the program, let us open Immunity Debugger and load the compiled program. We can do this by clicking on the folder icon on the top and selecting the functest.exe file. Before debugging each instruction of the program, let us briefly introduce the Immunity Debugger interface. On the left, we have disassembled code of the program. This is divided in four columns. The first column contains the memory address that contains the instruction. The second column contains the opcodes of the program. The third column contains the assembly code of each instruction, while the fourth column is created by the debugger and gives us further information about the instructions. On the top right panel, there is the registers view. This panel displays all the registers and their current values. On the bottom right panel, there is the stack view which contains the actual stack configuration. The first column contains the memory address of the stack. The second column contains the hexadecimal value contained at that specific address, while the third column contains the ASCII representation. The last column gives us more information about the value contained. Let's now start the program by clicking on the play icon on the top so that we can start debugging it. The debugger automatically stops at the endpoint. Notice that depending on the compiler and the OS version, the entry point may be difficult from the actual main function of the program. Indeed, in our case, the program stops before the main function and does some operations. Since we're not interested in these instructions, Let's scroll down a bit where the actual instructions of the main function are located. Here we can see the instructions of the main function. While right above, we can see the instructions of the functest function. Since we're not interested in this part of the code, let us set up a breakpoint at the beginning of the main instructions. We can do this by selecting the instruction and hitting F2. As we can see, the color of the instruction address changes. By setting a breakpoint, we are telling the debugger to stop the execution as soon as the program hits that specific instruction. Let us now run the program once again by hitting F9. The program stops at the breakpoint. We can see that the EIP register points to this memory address. Notice that the instruction has not been executed yet. Since we are moving into the main function, the prolog must be executed. The prolog creates a new stack frame and saves all the necessary information to return when the program ends. The first instruction, push EBP, saves the old base pointer onto the stack. In this way, it can be restored later on when the function returns. EBP is currently pointing to the location at the bottom of the current stack frame. Notice that we are currently in the stack frame before entering the main function. We can locate it in the stack by right clicking on it and selecting follow in stack. Here is the base address of the current stack frame. The highlighted addresses are the actual stack frame. Since ESP, points to the top of the stack and is located here. Let us step into it by hitting F7. The step into executes only one instruction. As we can see, EIP changes and it is currently pointing to the next memory address. If we check the stack view once again, we can see that Immunity Debugger automatically detects the previous stack frame and identifies it with a white bracket. Moreover, we can see that the value of EBP has been stored in the stack.
Right now, the base of the new stack frame is on top of the old stack frame. In the register view, we can see that the register is affected by the previous instruction. Immunity changes their color if their value changes. In this case, since we execute a push instruction, both EIP and ESP change. EIP points to the next instruction, while ESP changes to the point on the top of the stack. The next instruction that will be executed is move EBP ESP. This copies the value of the stack pointer into the base pointer and creates a new stack frame on top of the stack. As we can see, both EBP and ESP point to the same memory address. The next instruction is an instruction added by the compiler optimization, and it aligns the stack to 16 bytes. Accessing aligned values of the stack is much faster. Right now, we're not really interested in this instruction, so we can execute it and focus on the next one. The subESP20 instruction changes the ESP value by decreasing it. This is necessary to make space for the local variables. Remember that the stack rows backward. Therefore, we have to decrease its value to expand the stack frame. Once we execute this instruction, the actual stack frame on the main function is created. The EBP points to the base of the stack, while the ESP points to the top of the stack. The call instruction is again another instruction created by the compiler optimization. Therefore, we'll simply skip it by pressing F8. The next three instructions are the equivalent of the local variable statement in the source code. Indeed, 0b, 0c, and 0d are the hexadecimal representation of 11, 12, and 13. If we execute them, we can see that they're copied in the current stack frame. Notice that to do this, the instructions move the values into the address pointed by ESP plus 1c, 18, and 14. ESP is currently pointing to the top of the stack. Since the stack grows backward, adding a value means to go down in the stack representation. The local variables of the main function are now copied in the stack. The next instruction in the source code is a function call. As you already know, before actually calling the function, we have to add the function parameters into the stack. This is done by the next three instructions here. Once again, 20, 1f, and 1e are the hexadecimal representation of 32, 31, and 31. Remember that they're pushed on the stack in the reverse order. Once the function parameters are stored in the stack, we can actually call the function functest. As we can see in the disassembled version of the program, the address that it's going to call is the following one, which is the memory address where the functest is defined. If we step into, we can see that we jump to this memory location. Now the whole process we just saw is repeated. First we have the prolog that creates the new stack frame for this function, and then the local variable definition. Let's execute the prolog and then inspect the stack. EBP points here, while ESP points here. These are the boundaries of the new stack frame. Right below it, we can see instead the stack frame of the previous function, which in our case is main. Here we can see the EBP value stored by the prolog. This will be used in a moment to correctly return in the previous stack frame. Let us now execute the next two instructions and stop here. These two instructions are called epilogue. The purpose of the epilogue is to return the control to the caller, which in our case is the main function. Notice that the leave instruction is the equivalent of the following two instructions. Therefore, the leave instruction will first replace the current stack pointer with the current base pointer. This restores its value to before the prolog. Then it will pop the value on the top of the stack into EBP. If we take a look at EBP, we can see that it points to the memory address location where the main stack frame EBP is stored. Therefore, Moving EBP into ESP means that the top of the stack points to this memory address location. Once the ESP changes, the pop instruction will save the value on the top of the stack into EBP. Remember that at the top of the stack is stored the EBP of the previous stack frame. Let's execute it and see what happens. As we can see, we are now back into the main function stack frame. Indeed, if we check EBP, we can see that it points to the address location pointed here. Here indeed, we can see the local variables defined in the main function. 
The last instruction before leaving FunkTest is read in. This instruction points the instruction pointer. As we can see, the memory address location pointed by ESP contains the address of the next instruction in the main. This is the instruction right after the call of FunkTest. Therefore, once read n is executed, EIP will point here. Indeed, as soon as we execute it, we can see that the next instruction is this one. What we've seen so far is the entire process of how the stack changes and how stack frames are created and destroyed when we enter in or return from a function. This concludes our training video lesson on stack frames. Thanks for joining us.